Now I know many people have problems when it comes to choosing the right colors for a graphic design because it can get confusing out there with all kinds of color schemes such as complementary, split complementary, monochromatic and so on. However, here's a super simple method that works pretty much every single time. We're only going to need three colors for our scheme and the first color will be the base color or some people might say the dominant color. For this choice, we need to think about the design's message, feeling and also target audience. For example, a design that is marketing an organic drink could have a base color of green because that signifies health, nature and positivity. From here, we want to find a second color that complements our dominant base color. This is a color that will still fall in line with our design's message, but which is going to be used less as the base color. And for this design here, white is a good fit. White is after all still a color choice in graphic design, and it still holds true to the components I want to get across in my message. And then lastly, we want a color that creates contrast, you know, something that stands out on our design. A very dark green is a nice choice here, but something like brown or even purple could work too. So in this way of thinking about three different colors and basing it on our design, you can instantly improve your design's effectiveness just like that. What is the focal point and how can you tell a story through the focal point? With your designs, you should be trying to tell the audience a message and the focal point is what they're going to see first. So on this design, what would you say the focal point happens to be? Probably that huge chunk of salmon, but how does this tell a story on this design? The people the designer are targeting here obviously do like to eat fish, and so the hero of this design is a succulent piece of fish which will create a sense of desire in the audience. Also the designer has crafted it to look like a positioning icon, which leads into the concept of finding the taste. And then right here, one of the most simple designs ever but also one of the most effective. Tabasco sauce is hot, or well some people will say it's not hot. But anyway, it's a focal point and it's a grenade and that's going to explode your taste. On this design, the focal point here is the bag of groceries. And this design is targeting plant-based eaters who are typically more caring of the environment and into organic sustainable living. So instead of a plastic bag, the focal point is healthy food in a paper bag. That's not by mistake, that's through design choice. There is a very quick and simple thing you can do in Photoshop or other programs. This is a thumbnail design for a previous video on this channel and I do like the concept and I do like the design. However guys, if I take a shape layer of blue and I lay it over my design and then change the blend mode and finally go ahead and adjust the opacity to something that I think works well on my design, well now I have an entire scene that does seem to gel and tie together really nicely. This won't work on every single design or every single situation of course, but it's just one of those kind of really neat tricks to keep at the back of your design mind. The fourth way to instantly improve your design is to use well-known and tried and tested font pairs. Your typography talks to the audience and it's very easy to get wrong. Sticking to well-established font pairs is one way never to step a foot wrong on your designs. And here's something I quickly mocked up using Oswald as the main typography heading and then we have Railway as the subtext. There are various websites on Google that you can research commonly used font pairs and I'm going to link some of those down below. But there is one last very crucial way that you can instantly improve your graphic designs. One thing that many designers forget to consider is the viewer's eye. Now on this design here, I'm willing to bet something like 90% of you guys who saw this instantly were gravitated to the illustration on the far left. Also notice how this small orange circle kind of ushers the eye over to the right thereafter. Importantly, the designer wants the call to action button to be clicked, which can be found below the typography layout in blue. The color for this call to action button doesn't matter too much. The point is that it stands out. 
If you were to test out this design with a blue call to action button, as opposed to the ready pink that is seen all over the design, I can assure you that more people would click the blue button. And that's simply because it's more glaringly obvious. Anyway, the point here is that you need to consider the viewer's eye, because that will not only make your design more effective, but the layout becomes a lot easier to decipher and to work with. One thing that took me a long time to understand the importance of was the four main aspects of visual movement. After all, people do engage with our designs using their eyes. Being able to set up a design where you actively take your audience on a journey is a master skill. The four aspects of this are movement, shape of element, structure, and subject matter. Let's look at shape of element first. This is where a designer purposely uses a specific shape on a design that has an axis or line running through it and is carried through the entire shape. This causes the viewer to actually follow it along the design. On this website here, you can see that the beige peachy rectangle is actually carrying the viewer's eye along it. And then to the information on the left. Then we have this poster here. The designer has added red slanted rectangles that mirror the viewer's eye as it goes from the top left across and down the design to the right. Basically, the designer has laid out a path for the viewer to go along visually speaking, and they will do that subconsciously because going against it would just feel uncomfortable. The second point is subject matter, which is pretty similar to shape of elements, but it's more about visual cues. Think of fingers pointing or fists punching or eyes looking in one direction. As seen here on this poster, the arm is directing the attention up towards the bird. And on this website here, this woman's hand is literally directing attention to the main bit of information. But what about the third point, movement? So on a design, you can have design elements that work together to create a sense of movement. An example is this poster where various different shapes create a sense of movement upward. And then the fourth one we mentioned, structure. This is where Rudolf Arnheim's structural nets comes into play. It sounds pretty weird, I know, but the theory suggests that every canvas has a structure, even before design elements and assets go onto it. The structure starts with a point of focus, centrally so. However, the theory suggests that it's a tiny bit higher than the exact center, and this is where most eyes will just naturally land. Then we have the axes that run from corner to corner, and the points along these axes that are actually midway between the center and the corners also attract attention. These midway points can then be connected with vertical and horizontal lines, which create additional axes of visual force. So according to Rudolf and his theory, the eyes will actually follow these paths and they will actually land on the points of interest or focus. You may very well be able to see this in action in real life. And when you do start thinking about this, you begin to see designs very differently indeed. The next theory that is lesser known among graphic designers is visual tension. Like with a lot of theories in today's video, you won't see them on every single design and sometimes designers do them without even realizing. It can be achieved when design elements are positioned alongside each other that disrupt the viewer's experience. Now you can think of this as creating disharmony to Rudolph's structural net, and that's where design elements totally go against the channels or paths that he theorizes. Looking on this website design here, we can see multiple elements that come together and point to random places on a design. It just looks simply unorganized and uncomfortable to look at. Instead, we can remove random movement and direction from shapes pointing in all directions and create one solid point of focus like on this second design here. Now here's a very simple and effective but forgotten about theory. The theory of overall design composition direction. The three main directions for a composition can be horizontal, vertical, or diagonal. Horizontal compositions are more calming and stable. Now I don't mean kind of landscape designs, I just mean the directional movement of the design layout. Then vertical designs are good to show balance, boldness, and alertness. Then finally, the diagonal compositions will help to suggest movement and action. We can see here on this first design how everything just feels calm and still. The directional movement of the design as a whole is horizontal. And then for the second compositional layout, we have 
vertical. Here we see more vertical direction of the form with some slight diagonals with the red strike marks on the left. The design seems more bold, more striking and impacting. Then finally, the diagonal design. Notice also how this brochure has used the Satori color of yellowy orange. And that's a typical color for action and movement. It's no coincidence that the diagonal layout is matched to this. It's kind of like a double whammy of psychological traits on this design. Well, here's a design that is for life coaching and it's a landing page. Life coaching is all about changing somebody's life and also their thought processes. And one color that dictates change psychologically speaking is orange. Now we can vastly improve this design simply by linking that orange color in a few different ways. Firstly, of course, the call to action button would be standing out a lot more if it was orange and it does continue that flow over the design. And then also the brand name here in orange continues that link. This is highlighting the important components on my design, but also it simply looks more appealing and it's only a small change. Sometimes it is those small changes that make a huge difference. So you've been tricked and I've been tricked. UI and UX designers continue to trick people on a daily basis. There are various different methods that are used in marketing and business by graphic designers that do hack the brains of people. And I'm going to share with you these methods in today's video. But you might be asking why are they useful or why are they important? Well, because you can use them on your client projects or even on your portfolio website to boost clicks and conversions. The first thing I'm going to talk about is called the decision fatigue syndrome. And this states that people tend to feel stuck or confused when presented with too many choices. When a viewer of a design or a user of an app or website has decision fatigue, it causes them to make poor choices. They then become uninterested in the media and they often abandon the design or website altogether. And obviously that's not a good outcome for you or your design. So whenever you're displaying objects or design elements that require the viewer to look over each one individually, don't swamp them with a huge amounts of choice. One real life example here might be your design portfolio. Don't throw in 20 projects to your portfolio because this can lead to decision fatigue. You want those potential clients to not become confused or disinterested in your work. The next method is called the center stage effect. Now I'm sure you've seen this one in action and maybe have even been encouraged to buy something because of it. The center stage effect states that a user will often select the middle item from a choice of three. So say for example, there are three different price plans on a website, $15, $25 and $50. The middle one being $25 would appear to stand out more than the other two. Maybe the designer will make it taller, brighter and bolder in appearance. This all helps to lead the viewer subconsciously want to choose the middle choice. Of course, it's not going to work on everyone or even the majority of people, but this middle choice will gain a lot more clicks and conversions than the other two either side. It is a tried, tested and proven method. And speaking of proof, the next thing to talk about is called social proof and it's becoming more and more important with each passing year. It's why you see websites proudly show their trust pilot score on the homepage. This is because not only does it show that people have a good experience with that thing and it's like a reliable past proof, but also humans tend to move in herd mentalities. We do like to follow the crowd when it comes to certain things. But how can this help you? Well, if you have a portfolio website, it might be a good idea to get some testimonials from past clients. Or you could get things like fellow designers to comment on your social media posts or your work. Social proof is a powerful technique once it's applied properly. The next technique to be aware of is called the progressive disclosure effect. Now this talks about how people become overwhelmed when presented with complicated tasks or projects. If that complicated task is then broken down into individual tasks that often start off simple and increase in complexity, it can encourage that person to stay focused and within the task itself. This can be applied to infographics, brochures or leaflets. So often we have to explain something visually and if you break it down into individual components and in a simple way, then the design will become better accepted by the viewer. Also, you can use this when you want to show how you've solved problems for clients in your portfolio. Break down your graphic design process into easily digestible sections, and that will obviously help any potential clients easily understand your workflow. 
The Von Restroff effect is super useful across all types of design. It states that when people are shown multiple items or design elements, their brains are going to remember or recall the ones that stand out and are unlike the others. You can see this in many forms across many different forms of media. As an example in a magazine when you see a quote pulled from a group of text and it's shown to be larger, bolder or just a different colour. Or of course when a call to action button is clearly different from the rest of the design. It's just another tool or technique to add to your arsenal of directing the viewer and leading them around your design. The IKEA effect is quite a sneaky technique. Basically, people will put extra value to something if they've had some kind of input into its creation. So let's take for example a website where you download royalty free music or imagery or videos. You will pay a monthly fee to sign up and download that material. But in the website itself, you might be able to create favourite lists or categories to organise your downloads, and this will be personal to you and your account. You would then be more likely to stay subscribed and maybe even make future purchases because you've had an active role in creating something on that website. This technique can obviously be translated in many different ways across many UI design and business projects in general. So Miller's law dictates that humans can only memorize a finite amount of information. How much information changes from person to person, but most people can recall three to five bits of information at a glance. Designers should learn to limit how much information they present all at once, or just break things down into hierarchy of importance. So then you have things that you really want to stick in the minds of the person or the viewer, and you'd make them more obvious than everything else. You can see how all of these laws and techniques kind of intertwine into each other. Firstly, decide on one base color for your design. Now you can do this by thinking about an emotion you want to evoke, maybe calmness with blue. Maybe it's just the main color that your brand or client is using, or it might just simply fit the industry that you're designing for. So like here, the color notorious with the vegan industry is green, and that would be the base color for the designer's color scheme on this project. Then take that one single color and check out how it fits onto the color wheel in regard to three different harmonies. So first we have complementary harmonies, and depending on the kind of green that you choose, you could end up with anything from orangey reds to purple, and even maybe brown. It can also depend on your tints and the shades of the actual colour that you're using. The main colour green could then be accented with the second colour, which will be used to pick out focal points or maybe call to actions on your design. And then finally we have split complementary, which essentially offers up one base colour and then two secondary colours. So green and then purple and orange as an example. In choosing one base colour and then opting for these harmonies, you can quickly and easily make colour palettes that potentially work really, really well for your designs. On this first design right here for McDonald's, the designer has taken one of the brand colours, which is red, and then created an interesting background similar to what we looked at in a different video on this channel. And then they've used a complementary colour to that red, which is a deep green, and they've created a colour scheme for the design based around that. Complementary colour schemes are always striking and contrasting, and here it's just emphasising to the viewer the main focal points. Some people might look at this second design and assume that it's monochromatic, but they'd be wrong. This is analogous, and it's a really good example of how you can incorporate one with a gradient onto a design. And remember, analogous tends to be non-contrasting, and that's because it uses colours from the same area on the colour wheel and so it can either be really warming or cool. In this case, it's cool. It's made even more calming due to the nature of a gradient being used instead of block colors. But what about this one right here? Now this design doesn't only look really cool, but actually it's pretty sneaky with the color scheme. Now you might consider this being analogous once again. However, notice the touches of red that are used to emphasize small details. The red indicates that this is a split complementary colour design, using not red as the base colour, but as a starting point, and the red is used to highlight other areas. But I'm sure you're going to agree, this gradient effect is really, really cool, and so let's quickly look at how to recreate that technique, because, well, why not? So in Photoshop, come into the Layers panel, and on your image, come down to the Layers Adjustment menu. We first want to desaturate the image, right here. 
My design is already pretty much in grayscale, but this is how you do it in the adjustment layer. Then add another layer adjustment, but this time we want to choose gradients. Select your gradient and then dictate the angle that you want to move the gradient across your design. But importantly, make sure to move the gradient layer adjustment above the desaturation layer. Once you've finished tinkering with the gradient, come and change the blend mode of the gradient layer to something like overlay. And we can also adjust the opacity as well if you feel like the effect is just too strong. One further technique that we can use here is the dodge tool. And we use that to click and just highlight over areas of a design that you really want to emphasize that are highlighted with light. In the slider setting at the top, make sure to use a low exposure setting. And I often just use something like two or three. But yeah, this is how we can recreate the effect on the design that we just saw. And now all you need to do is you need to go and find some dope typography and just add those finishing touches. So the first thing I learned somewhere along the way is that pre-saved and pre-made things are an absolute lifesaver. And by that, I mean things like having contract or invoice templates ready to rock and roll, mockups saved ready to use, and libraries of icons saved into folders also ready to use. Having these things ready to tailor onto a client's project will save you so much time and energy. That leads me on to the next point. Time management is in fact a superpower. Manage your time down to the nanosecond. Okay, it may be not that precise, but make sure to plan out your time and ensure it's being used efficiently. I could not emphasize this enough. I really do hope you're jotting this stuff down or bookmarking this video, which reminds me of the next point, and that is to back everything up, not once, but twice. Many years ago now, I actually ended up losing my entire body of graphic design work in one fell swoop. And that's simply because my laptop was stolen. I was quite a noob back in the graphic design space at that time, and my work wasn't actually that great anyway. But of course, that's beside the point. Make sure to back your stuff up on external hard drives and something like a cloud application. Losing everything isn't just annoying, it will actually disrupt your workflow later down the line when a client needs something reworking or expanding on. In the 15 years of being a graphic designer, I've realized just how much the design success relies on typography at least being semi-decent. If you haven't done already, learn the basics of typography and also typeface psychology. And speaking of psychology, this is another thing that I've come to learn. A lot of graphic design uses psychology as a fundamental tool. This doesn't mean you have to run off to university and major in psychology, but you should brush up on things like color psychology, shape psychology, and educate yourself on how designs influence people's emotions and their feelings. And if you can actually implement that into your workflow and your designs, well, you're gonna become a graphic design god. You need to have empathy. Consider this, take a logo project for a financial company. Empathizing with their target audience, you choose blue for trust and reliability, and you incorporate a shield and an eagle for strength and security. These choices and these concepts, they can only be arrived at with initial empathy. But it's not just about symbolism. It's about a subtle idea being expressed through the logo as well. Those horizontal lines that you can see on the logo, they're not just aesthetic choices. They're deliberate design elements meant to evoke a sense of calmness and stability. It's shape psychology. The empathy-driven approach distinguishes a mere logo from a powerful brand symbol, fostering trust and a connection amidst uncertainty. Understanding the needs and the emotions of both audience and client isn't just design. It's the key to building a connection with a client and the audience through every single pixel. H for hue, or where on the color spectrum it is, S for saturation, also known as richness, and B for brightness. The main reason I like this slider is because if you've already established a very strong color scheme, you can just play around with the brightness and saturations, but remain on the same sort of ballpark in terms of the color. But yeah, you can really change the way a design looks and feels with this HSB slider. More saturation for loudness, less saturation for calmness, and so on. Also, like I've mentioned in a previous video, Sticking to a rule that actually originated from interior design, the 60-30-10 rule, that can really help make an effective color palette and end design solution. To learn more about that and some more graphic design tips, just click the video on screen. And until next time guys, design your future today.
Peace.